things, and they can be used if a fight breaks out in the middle of this dinner. Yes, crystal offerings for the Lord of the Shade. I should probably put this in my Broken Monster Combo series. Dear DMs, I apologize in advance for arming your players with the information within this video. Players, go crazy. Unless you're my players, I will TPK you again. Flail snails hold a strange place within this world. These are giant, beautiful snails with shells that reflect every color in the rainbow. They are farmed both for the trail of glass they leave behind and for their amazing shells. Thank you, NJR, for the video suggestion. I really hadn't looked into flail snails too much before this, and I'm very happy with what I'm about to present. This will be using the newest version of the flail snail stat block from Monsters of the Multiverse. This means no rules about getting tentacles cut off, no rules about a death whale, and the shell's abilities are much easier for the DM to run. Flail snails are well known for their diet of rocks and minerals, and for the fresh trail of glass their mucus leaves behind. Some people make a whole living off of following these snails and collecting their glass to rework it or sell it. When a flail snail feels threatened, it will use the mace-like tentacles from which it gets its name to bludgeon its attackers. It can also release energy stored within its shell in a blinding flash of light. This can stun attackers if they fail a wisdom saving throw as they stand there staring at the pretty colors. The light also lasts for an entire round, which gives attacks against it disadvantage. Perhaps the best thing about the flail snails is their shell's anti-magic capabilities. First, it grants the snail advantage on all saving throws against spells, and all spell attacks against it have disadvantage. If it succeeds on one of these saves, or one of these attacks misses it, it explodes in magical force as it redirects the spell. Every creature within a 30-foot radius of the snail takes 1d6 force damage per level of the spell, with a constitution saving throw for half damage. Remember, Descriptions using senses other than sight are a great way to keep your players immersed in the story. So, if there's a flail snail in combat and this ability goes off, what does it sound like? Does it sound like a giant gong? Or does it sound like a tiny little handbell? Since it's magic, I prefer to describe this sort of thing using sci-fi sounds from pop media. Something that the players at the table might recognize, like the shield from the Gungans in the Battle of Naboo. <laughs> or the seismic charges dropped by Jango Fett's ship. Now this actual magic resistance and this magical explosion isn't even the craziest part about this shell. The book specifically calls out that this shell can be used to create magic items. A skilled armorer can make three shields from this shell that have the exact same magical explosion ability that the shell itself has. The problem with this is that the explosion is a 30 foot radius that hurts enemies as well as allies. So rules as written, the shield is really only useful to solo adventurers. My fix for this is that as a reaction, the players can narrow it from a giant explosion in a full radius around them to a 30 foot cone instead. But that's my fix. That's not actually written in the rules anywhere. These anti-magic properties last a month after the flail snail dies, but after that, this shield can be turned into a spell guard shield, a very rare magic item that grants the wielder advantage on saving throws against spells and spell attacks against the wielder have disadvantage. It's like they got that exactly from the shell's description, or vice versa, because the shield came out first. Not only can the shell be turned into these three awesome shields, but the excess can be ground into powder, which is used to create another very rare magic item, a robe of scintillating colors. Scintillating? Scintillating? That's a weird spelling. This robe can do the exact same brilliant flash of light that the shell can do. Again, it's like they pulled one of these from the other. And those magic items are only what the book says it can be turned into, not what you can invent on your own. Maybe the shell can also be turned into a sword that casts dispel magic on things that it hits. Maybe a knowledgeable character would recognize earrings of a villainess as shells from slaughtered flail snail babies. Maybe the shell can be used in making arrows that deal extra force damage if the target they hit has an active spell up like slow, haste, invisibility. Maybe an eccentric billionaire has a dope-ass dinnerware set made from these shells. They don't do anything, they just look really cool. Or maybe they do do things and they can be used if a fight breaks out in the middle of this dinner. <laughs> and maybe if the shell is ground thinly enough, 
it can be turned into spectacles that can be used to see through magical illusions. Players, if you're watching this and you want one of those magic items, start begging your DMs now to throw a flail snail into the world. I know you're gonna want that dinnerware set. That way, you can poach them yourselves. Poach them? Hunt them? The morality of killing a flail snail is going to depend on the situation it's in. The most common adventurer hook that I've seen for flail snails came in the comment that suggested this video. A farmer approaches the party and asks them to take care of the poachers that are killing his flail snails for their shells. But the players might not get shells as a reward for this because if a shell is taken from the flail snail, it's going to die and the farmer's source of income will be lost. Unless maybe the bandits hadn't sold off the last shell they took. The last time I used a snail flail, wow. The last time I used a flail snail in my game, it was a part of a Morkoth's collection. Nothing really came of it because it wasn't a part of the player's, you know, current quest and there was no real hook. It was just kind of there. The players just went, huh. That's cool, and moved on. I know you guys can do a lot better than I did using this creature. Maybe there's a flail snail that is worshipped by a tribe of goblins. Yes, crystal offerings for the Lord of the Shiny. Maybe in your world, flail snails are bred for different attributes, and their diet is controlled, like any other domesticated animal. Maybe feeding them certain rocks changes the color or the tint of the glass that they leave behind. Or the ones with thinner shells can be sold off and the ones with thicker shells can stay so that their descendants all have continually thickening shells. Maybe a certain breed of flail snail has thicker or more workable glass. Now, perhaps the weirdest part about flail snails is their creature type. They are technically elementals. If you're just looking at the picture in the stat block, it's actually really unclear what kind of elemental this is. Snails are typically found in water, so it's a water one. It is immune to fire damage. Maybe it's a fire elemental. If it was a fire elemental, maybe the mazes would be superheated and deal a little bit of extra fire damage on a hit. If they were a water elemental, maybe they would be able to breathe underwater and the glass they leave behind could be turned into like this coral instead of a flat surface on land. Maybe a water flail snail can cast fog cloud, blinding its enemies while it can still see them via tremor sense. <laughs> Imagine the disco party it would look like inside of that fog cloud if it used its scintillating color ability. An air flail snail might be able to cast levitate on itself to allow itself to move faster than its 10 feet move speed. But according to the description in Volo's Guide to Monsters and maybe in Monsters of the Multiverse 2, they are earth elementals, which allows for possibly the coolest combo I've ever discovered in all of D&D. Using this combo, two level nine casters can deal 30 D6 force damage in a 30 foot radius around the snail. That is a larger area than fireball and more than triple the number of D6s you get to roll when you do damage. Hang on tight, this combo gets a little bit weird. First, a wizard or druid casts Conjure Elemental, summoning a flail snail up to 90 feet away, behind some cover if they can. Next, a wizard, sorcerer, circle of wildfire druid, or a fiend or a freedy patron warlock casts Scorching Ray, targeting the flail snail. This gets exponentially more powerful at higher levels, so let's assume they burn their fifth level spell slot. In an ideal world, with the magic disadvantage from anti-magic shell, and the snail behind three quarters cover, that's disadvantage on all of the attacks to hit on an AC of 21 for the snail. So chances are it will probably miss, but that's what you want. Because when a spell attack misses the flail snail, its anti-magic shell activates. If they do hit, the snail is immune to fire damage, so no worries there. With a fifth level spell, it pulses 5d6 force damage in a 30 foot radius DC 15 con save for half damage. Since a fifth level Scorching Ray has six attack rolls, that's a total of 30 D6 force damage in that radius and probably sounds something like this. <laughs> Quick side note for you proud min-maxers out there. A flail snail can use its shell defense, which gives them plus four to AC and restrains them, giving attacks against them advantage. This doesn't usually help but details on that are in the doobly-doo. All in all, a fifth level Scorching Ray results in 30 D6 potential damage in a 30 foot radius, 42 D6 at sixth level, 56 D6 at seventh, 
72 d6 at 8th, and 90 d6 if Scorching Ray is cast at 9th level. Though, at that point, you should probably just cast Meteor Swarm or Wish. Man, I should probably put this in my Broken Monster Combo series. Well, for all of you that hung on through that explanation, here's a little extra treat. The Flail Snail that is the target of that Scorching Ray doesn't necessarily have to be conjured. If there is a Flail Snail in the world that is being farmed, chances are a farmer might know Scorching Ray specifically so that they can do this. It would be an extremely effective way to fend off poachers, even if he can't upcast Scorching Ray. And yes, a farmer would definitely do this when the party is trying to poach his source of income. Will you let your players harvest the Flail Snail Shell? Have they harvested this before for its magical properties? Let me know in the comments, and remember, everything is going to be okay.